Hello and welcome to Ships, Sea and the Stars, our weekly online webcast from Royal Museums Greenwich. We'll be bringing you stories of the sea, space, history and creativity every week with Royal Museums Greenwich curators and special guests. And if you'd like to get in contact with us, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Just uh, search for Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. This week, we are finding our way through the topic of navigation. It's something that modern technology, I think, is actually really good at hiding from us because, you know, when was the last time any of us actually questioned the fact that our phones know where we are better than we do? I think it's probably a bit of a problem, uh, but it's very new in human history. Uh, and in general, navigation has been such a prized skill tipping the scales between success and failure for battles and migrations and serendipitous discoveries. It all hinges on whether you get those details right. And of course, the Royal Observatory at Greenwich was founded in 1675 precisely for the reason of better understanding the position of the stars, the sun and the moon in order to aid navigation at sea. So as we'll hear, information about how to get from to one particular geographical location uh, is still very important today. And we've got three fabulous and enthusiastic panellists to go on this journey with us. Uh, and they are Megan Barford, who is the curator of cartography at Royal Museums Greenwich. We have Erica Jones, who is the curator of <laughs> navigation at Royal Museums Greenwich. And we have Marie Gillespie, who's a professor of sociology at the Open University. So let's hear a little bit from each of you about your connection to this topic. Let's start. Well, let's start with the obvious one. You are curator of navigation, Erica. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, with this topic, um, I've got my hat on as a historian of science. And so I'm also very interested in how we make knowledge of the ocean using advances in science and technology, but also thinking about geopolitics and culture and how that comes into play also in navigation and our understanding of the sea. So today, I think that topic really fits with thinking about marine navigation and the satellite revolution of the 20th century. So I'm particularly interested in this time well, we'll period. Be here. We don't want to spoil everything too soon. So okay. let's, let's hold I'll stop there. <laughs> don't, 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 I'm, don't so I'm so excited. I'm so excited. We like that. We like the excitement. Okay, Megan. <laughs> So I'm the curator of cartography at Royal Museums Greenwich. That means I look after the charts, maps, globes and atlases in the collection of the Maritime Museum. Um, they have a very close connection with the subject of navigation and of wayfinding. Um, and so that's why I'm here today. Fabulous. And last but not least, Marie. Hi, everybody. Um, Yes, I've been working at the Open University and working on migration, communication and technologies for the last uh, few decades. And um, so uh, I've seen many different um, technologies come and go. In, in fact, my PhD was on the video cassette recorder and its use among South Asians and how uh, and migrate, you know, how they kept in touch with their home culture. And now today, um, uh, when we fast forward to the smartphone, I've recently been uh, looking at how refugees are using smartphones to make their journeys to safety. Brilliant. Well, we'll be hearing lots about that later on, but we're going to kick off with a reading. And this is an excerpt from actually one of my favourite books because of the story it tells. It's from Hawaii Rising by Sam Lowe. It's a book that tells the story of how modern Hawaiians rediscovered the navigation skills of their Polynesian ancestors. And there's a, there was a revival of both pride in navigation and in the knowledge of how to navigate across the ocean. I mean, if you're on a tiny Pacific island, that is something that, you know, you really need to be able to do if you want to trade. And the particular excerpt we're going to hear um, from is about, it's about the navigator Nainoa Thompson. Um, the canoe called Hokulea had just made the first big journey 3,000 miles across the ocean using natural navigation. And it was the last navigation by one of the old navigators, one of the last remaining Micronesian navigators. And, and the place where we meet the story now is when Nainoa, who is the modern Hawaiian, has to um, learn those skills. And so the canoe is coming back using modern navigation, but he's checking, he's watching the stars, he's trying to learn the ways of his ancestors. And so this is where Nainoa is in the middle of the ocean. And it's read by Simon Kane. 
It was easy to steer by a star low on the eastern horizon, hovering just above the house from which it had risen, but after an hour or so it was too high to be an accurate guide. Confounding the problem, he knew the stars rose four minutes earlier every day, so a star rising at sunset when the canoe departed would be useful for only a week or so. If I'm going to use the star compass, I've got to memorise lots of stars, Nainoa thought. As the canoe sailed north, crossing parallels of latitude, the houses where the stars rose and set shifted on the horizon. The angle of their arc, the time at night when they rise, their path in the sky, the amount of time they are in the sky, all change, he wrote in his log. So it's very hard to use the stars unless you have a magnetic compass to check them by. Observing the sky and testing his understanding of celestial motion, Nanoa began translating data into knowledge, a distinction he would use all his life. Data are facts. The stars rise in the east and set in the west. Knowledge is applying those facts to a practical end, finding your way across a vast ocean. I learned so much on that voyage, Nainoa recalls, because I was prepared to learn from my collection of academic ideas by putting them into practice, until it became knowledge. Nainoa was always looking at the sky, Snake recalls. He was always holding on to something, and looking this, looking that. I never asked him about it, because that's the way I do it. If you're learning something, you don't tell anyone, you just do it yourself. Nanoa observed first mate Gordon Pianania and navigator Kimo Lyman. They were old salts. These guys are amazing, he thought. They feel everything on the canoe. It takes a lot of experience to be like them. Now, I, I love this quote because there's a real feeling of him grasping the enormity of the task. Mm. That There's all these details. He's looking. He's kind of looking at the edge of it being lost, you know, these older navigators, these older experienced old, so salty sea dogs. And, and he's sort of just understanding the scale of what he has to become to be a navigator. What, what did each of you take away from this? Let's start with Megan. So, I mean, I guess one of the interesting things that he points to is the kind of links between practice and description of practice. And as historians, that's something that we kind of come up against all of the time as historians of sort of cartography and navigation um, for Erica and myself certainly sort of you know a lot of the time we're sort of thinking okay we've got these accounts but we don't actually know what it was people were doing and that's a really kind of complex thing to unpick and there are lots of reasons why people don't share what what they're doing um, but I think that points to something really important about the work of historians um, as well as the kind of the very complex work of cultural revival in the Pacific um, between kind of doing and knowing and the ways in which those things are transmitted. And Marie how about you what did you take away from that? Uh, well just um, picking up on what Megan said um, the relationship between seeing, believing and knowing. I've, I've listened to so many testimonies of refugees who've made that perilous journey across the narrow straits of the Aegean between Izmir and Turkey and the Greek islands. And um, the allusions to watching the stars, watching the weather, so many of them um, people told me how they were stuck in Izmir waiting for their agents or their smugglers for the weather to be right for the con sea conditions to be right and then they pack into the boat and then all the way watching the stars watching the sky and often you know if they're syrian refugees praying praying all the way and hoping that they arrive safely so that's what it it's a very humbling thing isn't it when you hear and actually the rest of the that book and a lot of stories of navigation are the same is that you're a little human and there's this big world and you're suddenly very small mm. and and you're sort of responsible for finding your way erica how about you well um i think it's incredibly powerful that they uh the polynesians were able to revive and recover their traditional navigational techniques, it came very close to those techniques being wiped out and lost from the earth, which would have been such a tragedy. And I think it's important to remember that that wasn't an accident. Uh, the Polynesian people are resilient and they've survived centuries of exploitation and colonialism 
from European and American nations. So I think it's amazing that this knowledge has come back and the reviving their connection, that very strong connection with the ocean that is so much part of their culture and identity. So um, very powerful. And I've, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to meet Nana and I've heard him talk and he always talks about teachers. He frames mm-hmm. everything in terms of the teachers because that's how you pass knowledge on. Okay, right, let's, let's get to some more, well, not more modern navigation, but some different types of navigation. So we are going to start, when we in the Western world think of navigation, the first thing that comes to the mind of most of us is a map. So of course we have to start with a map and Megan has a fabulous example to get us started. Megan, tell us what this is. So this is a volume called the uh, South Sea Wagoner, which is a manuscript volume of maps, so drawn by hand, um, from 1685. It's in the collection of the National Maritime Museum. And what it is, is an English copy of a Spanish derrotero. So this is a book of maps and directions um, for the west coast of South America. And it's a really interesting example of navigational knowledge being extremely valuable and also extremely secret. Um, So I said it's a copy and that's a really, really interesting point to start with. So this is a copy of a book that was taken by an English buccaneer captain, William Sharp, um, who was sailing in the Pacific with the intention of raiding Spanish settlements on the west coast of South America. Um, they seized a Spanish vessel called the Rosario um, and on board that ship there was this book of routes and this happened at a time when um, the in the context of the Spanish Empire the navigational information was very secret. Um, so just really remind us what year this was. So this is 1681 that um, Sharp seizes the Rosario. Um, So very tight control over navigational information. It was only ever issued in manuscript, so it wasn't printed. Um, It would only be issued to people who would use it for navigation. And it, in lots of ways, provided the sort of keys to European access to the coasts of South America. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because you, normally we think of a, a map as being the thing that points the way to the treasure, but in this case, it's the map itself, which is the, the treasure. The map itself is the treasure. And indeed, actually, on board the same ship, there were um, a number of slabs of a kind of greyish metal that uh, Sharp and um, his buccaneer colleagues thought were tin. Um, so they left them behind. They realised later that that was actually unrefined silver. Um, But the treasure was the Book of Maps. Um, So this was brought back to London. Uh, Once in London, the volume was translated and it was given to a cartographer called William Hack, who was one of the kind of foremost manuscript cartographers in in London in the sort of late 17th century. Um, So it's his work that produces these sort sort of beautifully detailed compass roses um, that you can see on on most of the pages, um, the kind of different shading of of the hills, um, the quite distinctive lettering. This wouldn't have been something that was taken on a ship. This is a very ornate um, kind of... So it's a status symbol. It's a status symbol and it's a particularly potent status symbol because it's drawn from knowledge that would previously have been inaccessible and were there other details because you know we we think of maps there's always that sort of i don't know it's a sort of trope that on old maps it says here be dragons you know there's observations about the um environment was there was was that a a style thing then is that um, i mean was it just here's the shape of the coastline or did they add details things that you might observe along the way yeah absolutely so um, not if you look at the different <laughs> pages, <not> um, <laughs> actually not. Um, if if you look at the um, the different pages, you'll see alongside the kind of graphic representation, which is in most cases an oblique view. So you're looking at 
a representation of what the coastline would look like from a ship rather than the kind of bird's eye view that we might more immediately think of as, as kind of map like. But you can also see that there are textual descriptions. So that tells you important things to look out for, um, what the bearings might be as you sort of sail into a particular harbour. Um, it will tell you, yes, yeah, sort of particular things to look out for along the way. And that's kind of a very old tradition, um, which continues in terms of having not just a map, but also a set of directions, uh, a variety of things that you're drawing on. Well, it makes as... it much more fun as a status symbol, doesn't it? Because if you were whoever it was who had this thing on display, they could then go on the, the imagination adventure, I guess. They can imagine what they might see. It, it, makes, it, it makes it very human, I guess. It's not, it's not just a map as information alone. It's a, a journey that you share if you read, um, if you read these maps. Yeah, and that kind of that um, impulse feeds out into the kind of voyage narrative genre of literature that becomes like a really big deal um, in terms of kind of giving people armchair access, as it were. To, um, Definitely, you know, in that country. period with very with ships that were damp and you know had a few weevils around, I can see that armchair <laughs> access might have been an attractive option. And we're, let's let's move on to our next object. So for most of us, navigation is something we barely think about because you know there's that moment. This has probably happened to all of us at some point where you look at your phone to find out where you are, and a dot appears, and the GPS tells you this that you are here, but because it hasn't filled in the map around it, you don't know where here is. And I think that is really simple of um, our dependence on GPS. It doesn't tell us anything without context, but we completely believe it. So we're going to move on to Erica. And um, Erica has a, a, an, an object which I will be honest and say, I don't think it's the prettiest thing in the world, but it is very interesting. Tell us what this is, Erica. Well, I think this is a, a fabulous object because it really speaks to the history of GPS. And just right off the bat, uh, let's get it out in the open that GPS is a, is it's a specific system, the Navstar Global Positioning System. And that is a system that was started by the US military during the Cold War. And in the 1980s, something exciting happened and that's where this object comes into play. 1983, GPS was open to civilian use. So this GPS receiver was made in 1985 by Trimble and that's part of the story that this object tells. And so who would have used this? Was it, I mean, because this, I think it's, um, it's really interesting the idea of opening up that the US military had this access and then they sort of went, oh, well, maybe everyone can know this. And why did they do that? It seems like such a counterintuitive thing in a way. Why would you give away all that information? Good question. Uh, President Ronald Reagan at the time decided to open up GPS technology at first for aviation. That's after um, an airplane was shot down by a Russian missile. So it was used for safety at first. And um, when you ask like who used this uh, GPS receiver, it, this receiver tells us a lot about who had access to GPS during that time. It was expensive. Something like this um, was not a cheap commodity. It would have cost between, say, five and 10,000 pounds in the 80s. Uh, so it wasn't something that you could go down to Radio Shack and buy yourself. It was, it was generally used by large companies. This particular model was made to be used on a ship, and they would likely have been doing uh, geo survey, surveying and especially this would have been a fantastic kit for people working on oil sea, uh, oil sea rigs, especially thinking about like the North Sea in the 1980s, getting ready to position their rig exactly, exactly where they need it to be in order to drill for oil. And did they trust it? Because I imagine, you know, every time a technology like this comes along, two things happen. There's a load of people who go, oh, well, it's not proper navigation and people won't understand where they are. And they might have had a point. If you look at people navigating on the, on the streets with their phones now, they might have had a point that people have lost the skill of navigation. So the first thing is that people say, oh, we well, are losing something because people don't have to understand. And the second thing is that, do you trust it? Does it work? Mm. 
Did it work? Well, it worked in a very different way. I think about um, for the GPS system in operation today, you need a minimum of 24 satellites circling the Earth in order to get a fix on your position anywhere on the planet 24 hours a day. If you turn this machine on in 1985, there were four satellites. Uh, circling the earth at that time. That meant you could not get GPS just any time of the day. Uh, those crews, they would have had to wait and generally they would get a GPS fix once a day because they had to wait for a bit thinking about like stars. You had to wait for those satellites to come above the horizon to fix your position at sea. That's really, that's really interesting because we associate the days of, you know, having to wait till noon, get your sextant out, that we assume that had gone, but it's, I hadn't, appre I hadn't appreciated it was so few when it first became yeah. available. It was so few, and just one other thing about the use of it, if you look back to um, this beautiful object, <laughs> and okay. you see sure um, you. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, on the front there, that's where uh, it would have been a digital read readout of your latitude and longitude. And so you wouldn't have seen your position on a map at all. You would have taken those coordinates and then put them literally on a paper chart and using your sextant or maybe your uh, radar nav navigation to be able to pinpoint where you were. So it was quite a different system back then. And did people, did they foresee that this, that, that this would become available to everyone? Or did they just assume this was specialist technology? Was, it, was the vision already there that this, this is the navigation of the future? I think it was. I think companies like Trimble, they were based in Silicon Valley, and it was a bit like the dot-com boom, uh, you know, what would happen decades later. GPS was very exciting, and there were research and development teams working in, in different countries trying to adapt this exciting technology of GPS into consumer electronics, and that's a big part of the story. I think it takes a lot of imagination to do that when you've got objects as big as that. <laughs> like only computers, I guess, you know, these things that fill the whole room. Um, so, well, GPS became, obviously, you know, we all take it for granted now. I, so I asked uh, Twitter about navigation and Twitter had a lot of comments on navigation, mostly of it going wrong. <laughs> Very entertaining comments about it going wrong. But, Fantastic. Um, there was one that um, I wanted to pick out, actually, because it's from a colleague of mine, and I was there when this happened. But he, he's talking about measuring meteorological things at the North Pole, because obviously, if we go out to make a measurement now, we take a GPS unit. That tells us where the measurement is. And um, he says, it's, you'd be surprised at how difficult it is to measure exactly what the orientation of a bit of kit is when it's on drifting sea ice close to the North Pole. And I remember this, because the problem is that when you're very close to the North Pole, magnetism doesn't really help because mm. the magnets don't really know where to point because you're so close and so gps is really helpful but you don't know which direction you're pointing in because you haven't got a compass and it's really disorienting you're like oh i must know where i am i've got gps i've got all these instruments that tell me where i am and yet if you if you asked me to point to america i couldn't have done because it's it, you know i would have had to get a map out and orient myself within that map using the gps and it's just a really interesting um you know it's there are things that GPS does that old navigation methods could never do, really. Um, anyway, so that's so moving on, we're, it's one of the things that is important about uh, navigation in general, especially if you're going to share it with other people, as we're talking about, is having an agreed set of rules. You need a frame of reference um, that, that everyone else can um, agree on and then we can all use the same system and actually one of the other comments i got on navigation from twitter was about nasa losing a 100 million dollar mars orbiter because one lot used uh inches and the other lot used the metric system and the navigation information was given to the device in metric units and was expected in imperial units and so they lost a hundred million dollar orbiter don't wow. do that if it's ever you <laughs> check your units anyway so but in our society we tend to assume that someone's just sorted all of that out that navigation is somebody else's problem and it's just done and you don't need ingenuity anymore but Marie's next object is a, a great example of how navigation is still an active, humans still need to participate in this. So Marie, tell us what this is. So, um, have you, can you see the, the map in front of you? I oh, can, yes. Yeah, I should perhaps just say a few words about um, how I came across this map. 
um, I was researching the use of smartphones among Syrian refugees during 2015 and 16. And a young 20-year-old um, Syrian refugee showed me this um, on his WhatsApp. And he said that this was the map that he was using or, and had used to get to Europe and his hope was to get to Germany. So um, if we start at the top, I'll talk you through it. Um, we don't know who made this map um, and we don't know how many times it's been shared. In Arabic at the top, it says the road to Germany and the cost of the journey, journey from Izmir in Turkey to, uh, to Germany is $2,400. And um, it's a kind of bird's eye picture and it's been made really with meticulous detail with these little icons. So from Syria, imagine, I think you really have to put yourself in the shoes of a Syrian family who've bomb, been bombed out of their home. They, they have no other means of um, seeking safety but to get a car, head to, um, head, head to Turkey, head to Izmir, where um, using their smartphones, knowing um, other people who'd made the journey before, perhaps in possession of this map, they make their way to Izmir, they use their phones to connect um, an agent they call them agents, not necessarily smugglers, as we call them in the, um, quite often in the uh, media. And then very quickly, I'll take you through it. You can see that from Izmir, the journey by boat to the Greek islands, um, and from the Greek islands, it's assumed that uh, you can go on to Athens, and then you move on to Thessalonica. Um, and you can see each leg of the journey uh, the amount of money in dollars um, or in uh, euros and you can also see that the Arabic is um, if you're an Arabic speaker it's it's phonetic so that the um, person using the map would be able to um, pronounce correctly where they think they're going and how they're going there what the cost is and what the means of uh, transport is and what the currency is. So they move through Thessaloniki and then to Macedonia where they have to walk through forests. This is the Western Balkan route, which was very, it was the most common route in 2015 16. Um, after 2016, um, uh, the, this route was closed, the borders were closed. But at this time, you could then take the train. Um, uh, through uh, to Skopje, through Serbia, where you would again have to do some by leg, walking through forests, then by train to Belgrade, and then through Hungary to Budapest, and then finally to Ger Germany. And you'll see at the very end, there are two stick figures jumping for joy, um, who have made um, the successful journey to Germany. And this indicates that somebody has printed this digital map that was shared on WhatsApp. Um, they've drawn those stick figures and, um, and so hard copies and digital copies were made. And do we know, I mean, it's interesting because the idea in general, if you are going to share a map, you kind of check it, right? You do it yourself a few times to see it works. And yet this is a journey that most people presume they only make once. You, you go because you want to get to Germany, not because you ever want to end up back in, in Syria. So how, how did they know it was accurate? Just, do we know anything about, do they just trust the ones who went before? How do these sorts of things evolve? So that's a really good question. And um, at that time, um, you would have families and friends who would have made the journey ahead of you. And WhatsApp group, WhatsApp <laughs> was absolutely vital to making these journeys. So people who'd gone before um, would have connected with agents and smugglers. And the agents and smugglers were part of transnational networks. Uh, they, they had people in all the major cities. If you look at the map, the major cities are the people where they might connect with an agent who might walk them through the forest, etc. So they trusted they didn't necessarily trust the map or they didn't necessarily trust the agent, but they did trust the people who had successfully made it to Germany before or who had successfully used. 
I suspect that this was a map created by agents. I don't know. But there's a kind of element of, um, it's beautifully designed with the little icons. It's kind of inviting. It makes it look easy. In fact, it's not easy, this journey. Uh, well, it's interesting because it really it highlights um, the question of navigation being different for different people. So, you know, in a world with credit cards and smartphones and things like that, you know, if, if I wanted to go to Turkey, for example, presumably lockdown notwithstanding, I could buy a flight and I could go to the airport and I get on the flight and I wouldn't have to know anything and I would be in Turkey. But that is accessible to me because of the country I was born in and because of where I grew up, you know, various um, serendipitous things. and what you're describing is a sort of a parallel navigational world for mm. people who don't have access to that one route, but there is a system. It's not random. There is a system. It's just their system is invisible to me and my system is invisible to them. Is, is that a fair representation? Yes, that is, and that links, I think, to Megan's point earlier about how this map, um, although it was shared among those making the journey, because those journeys were deemed to be illegal, the European migration policies and the border management and control meant that Syrian refugees were actually criminalised if they, um, there weren't very many safe legal routes open to them. And if you didn't want to end up in one of the camps in, in Turkey or Lebanon or Jordan, where five million uh, refugees were, were, were taken, if you had family in Germany or the UK, and you had, um, you, you, you would want to, you, you may want a better life for your, uh, your family. So very few safe routes uh, would have been uh, available. Um, so this idea of the control of information, the secrecy of information, the knowledge production, the people who put this together, there's a collective knowledge that's gone into this. It's tried and tested. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's like, an alternative form of tourism, because obviously it isn't. These are tragic journeys. These are journeys that, you know, for example, you know, the journey between Izmir and the islands in Greece. Well, we know that so many people have died since 2015, 14,650 or so recorded deaths. People have died in that very narrow strait, which is only two and a half miles. Compare that to the, the Dover Straits, which is roughly 20 miles at its, um, its shortest. You know, and people are, um, those journeys are, are, um, are longer uh, and more difficult. But, but these were incredibly difficult journeys. They're heartbreaking. I was involved in um, making a BBC co-production um, with the Open University called Exodus, Our Journey to Europe. Um, and their smartphone, uh, refugees were given smartphones to film their journeys. It's an absolutely profound and moving three-part documentary series. You can actually view it. Um, I, I mean, if you want to get more detail about what those journeys mean and how this map comes to life, because these are, you know, these are human stories. Well, we're going we're gonna to come back to Syrian refugees and, and these journeys. And, um, and it is interesting, as you say, that not only do maps give information, but they also hide the practicalities of what it can take. So uh, if you're just joining us, this is Ship Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich. And this week we're talking about navigation with curators Megan Barford and Erica Jones and the Professor of Sociology, Mar Mary Gillespie. Now we're going to start the second half with one of my favourite excerpts on the topic of maps and it is from The Wonderful Hunting of the Snark by Lewis Carroll and it's read by Simon Kane. The bellman himself they all praised to the sky, such a carriage, such ease and such grace, such solemnity too, one could see he was wise the moment one looked in his face. He had bought a large map representing the sea without the least vestige of land and the crew were much pleased when they found it to be a map they could all understand. What's the good of Mercator's North Poles and Equator's tropic zones and meridian lines? So the bellman would cry, and the crew would reply, They are merely conventional signs. Other maps are such shapes with their islands and capes, but we've got our captain to thank, so the crew would protest, that he's bought us the best, a perfect and absolute blank. 
This was charming, no doubt, but they shortly found out that the captain they trusted so well had only one notion for crossing the ocean, and that was to tingle his bell. It's, it's, it's a great excerpt, and part of what I love about it is that, you know, you can hide from the complication, but it's going to find you out in the end. So let's move on to Erica's next object, and this is where GPS meets the rest of the world. So Erica, tell us what this is. Okay, um, this is um, two objects that work together. And first off, I love this photo. I took this the last day I was at the museum before lockdown. Uh, this museum, I mean, this piece, uh, this object is now part of the national collection and it's just been taken into Kidbrook. So here we are. This is the Hunter 16. It's the first portable computer to be enabled with GPS one well, of the very first in the world. So it's a very special object. The portable computer there, it's a Hunter 16. Uh, the Hunter 1 was actually the very first portable computer. So this is uh, a few generations on from that. But the real magic and power of this comes from the next object, which is the XR4 PC. It's a fabulous name. It was made by Navstar Systems. And it was developed by a research and development team working in Daventry, England. So the magic happens when you put these thing, two things together. So think that you have one of the very first portable computers on one hand. And this, what we're looking at, is a GPS receiver made in 1991. Think of the one that we saw earlier. It's which not was that much made... later. They're very close exactly. to only six years. It's only a few years. Um, it's hard to see in the photo, but it's very lightweight. Um, it doesn't weigh very much. And you could slide this into your portable computer like the Husky Hunter or into any uh, desktop machine that was running uh, IBM at the time. So what did this people was do with that in fusion. 1991? What, why were people buying a portable computer that knew where it was? Good question. Again, this wasn't something that probably the average public was using at this time. This would have been used by oceanographers, scientists, and again, people doing research at sea. And it's really fantastic because it just makes this package where you can run software on the Husky portable computer where you're maybe putting in data such as your meteorological conditions and at the same time you've got that GPS running and so you can pinpoint your location at the same time so it was just really powerful stuff to do those two things at the same time well, on I say took, a weather ship portable rugged computer to the North Pole two years ago and my laptop didn't know where it was and that was designed, <laughs> I'm going to complain, designed for the outdoors environment, it didn't know where it was. And oh. so how did all of this develop then? I mean, what, once, once someone's had this spark, what happens? Mm -hmm. Well, part of what's going on here, it's, it's the history of navigation, but also it's thinking about these are consumer products. So people like working in Daventry, they were trying to make things like that GPS receiver smaller and more affordable and more flexible, right? And they want to sell products. And so they're trying to see how they can combine it with other things going on at the time. It's only a few later, years later in 1999 that we had the first smartphone, a mobile phone with GPS. So all this change happened really quickly. It was also developed by a, a female-led research team, is that right? <laughs> yes. Um, well, I was able to meet some of the designers and innovators in Daventry and Jacqueline Bickerstaff, she's one of the uh, head engineers at that time. She's retired now, but it, it was amazing. Her story is also linked with the transition of navigational technology in the 20th century. Before going to GPS, she was one of the world's experts on DECA radio navigation and Loran navigation. And so it's a good reminder that GPS didn't just automatically replace everything. Uh, navigators were still using radio navigation and sextants and paper charts and their GPS at the same time. So I think it's, it's interesting that technology doesn't happen all at once. It's kind of a messy affair. 
And I think it's still the case today that if you pass your open ocean yacht master exam, which is what you need to captain a ship on the high seas, you still have to use a sextant. You have to navigate using a sextant and all modern bridges on ships have sextants in them. Okay, let's move on. So, you know, we, we've said that GPS is most useful when you can connect it to a map. So let's go back to a map um, and ask the question of where maps come from. So Megan, this one's yours and it is the Galapagos Islands. Tell us about this map. So I chose this um, this map, this chart um, specifically, um, to be sort of representative of state and military involvement in marine charting um, in the 19th century. Um, this chart is published by the Hydrographic Office of the Admiralty, which is an office that was founded in 1795 to publish um, charts for use by the Royal Navy and then slightly later in, in the um, 1820s uh, they were made available for sale to uh, masters in the Merchant Marine to a, to a commercial audience. This is a chart of the Galapagos Islands. It was made during the voyage of HMS Beagle. HMS Beagle, as we know, is most famous because of a certain young gentleman naturalist who was on board. But in and the story of Darwin, for anyone <laughs> who wasn't sure, <laughs> in the story I'm telling today, he's he's a kind of side note. Um, he happened to be on board. The work they were doing on the Beagle was very intensive survey work. Um, and how long does it take? I mean, so this, you know, it's a very detailed map, as you said. But how long? Do, how much? To, you know to send a ship out it's, it's an expensive thing to do what's the kind of cost to benefit ratio there how much time do you have to spend to get a map as good as this um so surveying voyages were long um they would typically be i guess between sort of four to six years depending on the particular circumstances um and it's extraordinarily intensive work so for um surveying a coastline that involves the measurement of thousands and thousands and thousands of angles. It involves sort of taking all the sort of little numbers that you can see on the chart. Those are soundings, they show the depth of the water. Um, each one of those numbers would be based not just on putting a log, a lead line over the side of a boat or of the ship to gauge the depth of the water, but then also calculations to correct that if it's um, near the shore, to account for the tides. Um, and you can so see there's currents on there as well, and there's all kinds of information. Yeah, and you can see, if you can see some of the letters that are underneath the numbers, um, so they actually show you what the nature of the seafloor is like. There'd be a little bit of tallow at the bottom of the lead, which would pick up a sample from the bottom of the sea. And that is both interesting for people interested in natural history so Darwin loved that um, but also navigationally useful if you are in an area where it's particularly foggy um, and you can't see the coast if you know that there's a particular shift in what the nature of the bottom of the sea is like you can actually navigate by the bottom of the sea I love um, the ingenuity that goes into navigation. There's, it's like every, if you really look at, at navigation using to this, every tiny little possible detail goes in. We are going to move on. It's, I'm sure there's so much to discuss here. We're going to move on to come back to the modern day. Um, and, you know, let's get back to the idea of the inevitable consequence of navigation. Humans have always gone somewhere. Uh, you know, they've explored, they've gone but when they've gone, they've got somewhere. So the consequence of navigation is that people end up somewhere else. And this is very relevant to Marie's topic today. So Marie, tell us about your next object. So my next object um, is a bag. I have, it, I have one here made out of um, the life jackets that the refugees making the journey across um, the Aegean Strait between Izmir and one of the Greek islands. Um, so it's a bag that's made out of the life jackets. So I just want to rewind a few steps to pick up on a few of the issues that have been um, 
uh, discussed. And one is about, you know, the, this transnational network of smugglers and agents. Some operate like bona fide agents and get people from A to B quite successfully. But many are um, very unscrupulous. And one of the most tragic elements of the stories that you hear is when, when people get to Izmir, two of the first things they buy are a life jacket and a little plastic pocket to put their phones in so they don't get wet on the journey. And some of those life jackets, they're not fit for purpose. They're using cheap material. And this is one of the main reasons why a lot of people die at sea, apart from um, the fact that many people can't swim, that the weather may be bad, the navigation could be very bad, they could get into trouble. And again, the smartphone is hugely important. They, uh, there's um, there's a, a call, a alarm phone, is a, it's a kind of a phone number that they all carry with them if they get into trouble, and then they're rescued. That's another story about the politics of rescue. Um, but imagine during 2015-16, a million life jackets would have been discarded on the beaches of the Greek islands. Lesbos is where I did my, my field work, um, but Chios um, as well, and, and, and several other Greek islands. So here, um, this is a picture of the um, life jacket graveyard um, where the municipal authorities would go and, and um, you can see here um, the dinghies, the life jackets. So the story I want to tell um, after the, the kind of sadness and tragedy of so many journeys where so many people have died is that those who did arrive and those who, who were able to arrive safely, they, they were able, um, if they were lucky enough, to find um, locals on Lesbos who supported them, to um, um, be supported by a kind of a solidarity network. And this solidarity network, Lesbos Solidarity, it's a, a well-known uh, refugee support organization that's been helping and supporting refugees for many many years they decided that alongside the refugees they would go they would do some upcycling and they would they would make these bags and a designer a retired designer she helped design them and there was one afghan tailor in particular whose designs were particularly prized now these bags were part of refugee enterprise and they're sold um, through Lesbos Solidarity's um, uh, website. Um, so it's a kind of, some people have criticized this kind of artisanal production for um, commodifying refugee journeys. Um, but on the other hand, those people who are volunteers and who, and refugees who've worked in these workshops, um, it's very clear that it allows them meaningful uses of their time while they wait on Lesbos, sometimes for months, sometimes for years. There still remains over 20,000 um, refugees on the island of Lesbos. And going back to this issue of the European migration policies, which are actually not, um, they're, they're not really enabling um, a very fair distribution of the responsibilities across the European member states. The Dublin Convention, for example, means that um, a, an asylum seeker has to claim asylum in the first country in which they arrive. And geography and sea dictates that that will be the islands of Greece or Lampedusa or Spain or um, Malta, for example. And these, cu these countries have, have had an enormous problem dealing both, say, take Greece, who, you know, underwent a the most terrible financial crisis as well as a, 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 a migration policy crisis. So these bags, I think, re represent something of a politics of hope. They can um, raise some consciousness about 
the lives of refugees. But at the same time, I do think that um, the public imagination um, and the media debate is extremely limited, focused on numbers, focused on authenticity. Are they real or are they not? Um, focused on criminalization, on illegality. And I think anything that we can do to humanize this debate, to humanize these sea journeys and sea crossings, and the navigation, both um, you know, maritime, over land, and digitally through the smartphone, and the use of the GPS, of course, uh, on the smartphone is another sort of important element, um, I think is very important. And that's why I've been really glad to be part of this discussion today. I think they are obviously very important points and I'm, I'm the daughter of a refugee and so and I find it very difficult to listen to a lot of the discussion now. But I, I want to do a comment just finally on, um, you know, it's perhaps a, a slightly less serious point, but in lockdown, many of us have had our navigation limited that, you know, if you asked somebody who was reasonably well off in the Western world a year ago, can you go wherever you want? They'd have said, yes, if I can afford a plane ticket. Of course I can go wherever I want. And suddenly lockdown has taken that away from us. Just very briefly, do you see any do you see any sympathy coming from that that people are suddenly realizing what it's like to be even a tiny bit restricted, just a tiny, tiny bit? Do you do you think that helps or or are they so thinking about themselves so much they don't notice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm currently involved in a project called COVID Chronicles from the Margins, shamelessly ripping off an idea from the BBC, but looking at how uh, lockdown has affected asylum seekers and, and, um, and refugees. And the one thing they all say is that now the general population knows what it's like to live like a refugee, afraid to go out, limited mobility, living in fear of, a, um, a, a, of a, a, an anonymous or unknown enemy. Um, so I think, I, think, I think we've all got a lot to learn from refugees. And it, it does really show the power of navigation, not just being as a Western explorer, but actually navigation around our world, na navigation in a broader sense through a shared world. And that's another very good point, just to... Uh, for me to finish anyway is that navigation is also digital isn't it and so we've all been navigating new worlds digitally like we are doing now <laughs> thank you so much okay uh we have to finish there i didn't have time to tell you all the funny stories twitter had to share with us we'll be back next week with more museum objects more stories more of everything that is in the fabulous royal museums greenwich do get in touch with us on facebook instagram or twitter look for royal museums greenwich um it, the national maritime museum is reopening on monday the 7th of september it is still free to visit but you do need to book an entry slot online and once you're inside there are no time limits you can look at all the objects that you've been missing for as long as you like so to find out more just go to rmg rmg.co.uk slash welcome back and it only remains to me to thank our three fabulous contributors megan barford erica jones and marie gillespie uh, simon kane did the reading steve thompson was responsible for the music james gill was the producer and i'm helen chersky and i will see you next week